All right, Jay Mills. What's up? What's up, man? What's up? Hey, nothing much, man. Good to have you. Yes, sir. I'm glad to be here, man. Thanks for the opportunity, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. Well, I thought we'd get into your whole story and get to know you a little bit better. And, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, for the people who might not know, you know what I'm saying, about you or, you know what I'm saying, your full story and everything. Yeah. You know, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and where'd you grow up at? Uh, well, I grew up in Harlem, New York City, born and raised in Harlem, New York City. Uh, if anybody knows me, they know I'm 100 percent Harlem. You know what I'm saying? If you don't know me, you can be around me for about five minutes and you can know I'm Harlem. You know what I'm saying? You can know where I'm from. You know how I talk. You know how I joke. You know my slang, all of that. But me as a whole, I've been outside since I was a teenager just battling, whether it was high school, whether it was the block. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people know me from battle rap. So they don't know, like, before, like, the Smack DVDs, I really come from the battle rap shit. Like, me and Loaded Lux and Murder Mook and T-Rex. Like, people look at them like legends, but they don't understand, like, I was outside with them. But I went and did the no, no, no shit. And then I did the young money shit. All, I got to all of that. So the shit that I was doing when I was young kind of just got, it just probably just get lost in the transition if you just follow in the timeline. So to take it back to everything, born and raised in Harlem, I went to school for art. I went to art school. I went to the high school of art and design in New York City. Shout out to everybody that went to art and design. Ferg went to art and design. Mob Deep went to art and design. Rest in peace, Prodigy. Fab went to art and design. You know what I'm saying? So just real artsy. And I think through art is where I started to love writing raps. Probably just from drawing. I always tell people I look at words like colors. And that's probably coming from me going to art school. You know what I'm saying? Going to art school, you got black. I always tell people you got the black, white, grays, but you got red, green, yellow, orange. It's, it's the same thing with words. You taking the words and you making a masterpiece. So I learned that out of like, I mean, like when I was 14, 15, I had that transition of trying to like the artsy shit and the music shit. And do I really want to be an architect and a cartoonist or do I want to be like Big L? Do, you know what I'm saying? Do I want to be like Children of the Corn? Because that was like my, that was like our NWA in Harlem. Children of the Corn. Big L, Mace, Cam, Herb McGruff, Rest in Peace Bloodshed. To us on Lenox Avenue, just hearing them on mixtapes, that shit made it real for us. So... That was my era of Harlem, you know what I'm saying? Growing up, looking up to niggas like Mace, Big L, Cam. Like I said, and once Mace went did All Out and Cam did Dipset and everybody, like we literally seen that shit. You know what I'm saying? So growing up, like Harlem just fully made me, like if, like at the end of the day. Growing up, seeing everybody rapping, did that inspire you a lot to want to rap? Hell yeah. Like I said, I went to school for art. I went to high school for arts. Um... Uh, I went for cartooning, fashion, and architecture, but I took one each year. So one year, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I come back sophomore year, I want to be an architect. I come back junior year, and I want to be a fashion designer. You know what I'm saying? But in between all them years, I'm going to the back table in the lunchroom. You know, I'm, I'm battling on the trains going home from school. Fucking up in school so much from rapping and battling in the lunchrooms and all that shit. Now I'm going to night school. Now I'm battling people on the train coming from night school. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to night school just to get into battles. Cause this was, this was people that wasn't in art and design. If I'm going to Washington Irving night school or Norman Thomas summer school, these is people that don't know these rhymes. They don't know me. So I'm coming in here and I got to kill shit the same way I kill shit in school. That was my mentality. Cause I'm growing up listening to Big L. I'm growing up listening to Killer Cam. Not Cameron uh, Dips. No, I'm listening to Kill. I'm not listening to M.A. Dollar Sign E. I'm listening to Murder Mace. You know what I'm saying? Like Big L digging in the crates. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm listening to shit like that as a 14, 15 year old kid. Like my first CDs that my moms bought me. Just listen to this. My first hip hop CDs that my mother bought me, like official compact disc where I could look through the booklet and see where the song was recorded and who sampled it. Fat Joe, Jealous Ones, Envy, and AZ, Do or Die. I'm going to school listening to this. And my, this is what I got for Christmas. My mom's bought me a three CD changer and this, and probably an SNS tape, DJ SNS or DJ Craig G or some shit like that. So I'm going to school. I, as a teenager, I'm growing up in Harlem. I'm trying to paint a picture for you. I'm growing up in Harlem on 144th Street, 
Kim is on 140th Street. Big L is on 139th Street. McGruff is on 141st Mace. Dame Dash and his crew is from 142nd. So now this is coming more real to me than becoming an architect. You know what I'm saying? This is becoming more real to me than becoming a cartoonist. Not saying I wouldn't have ever done it, but just being able to see that type of shit, that shit changed everything. Like being right there in the middle of it, you know? What was high school like for you? High school was fun. I wasn't like, if you ask anybody that went to high school with me, wasn't no punk, wasn't no bitch. I wasn't no gang member. I wasn't slicing people's faces, trying to get initiated with the bloods when they came to New York. But I had friends that was like that. Like I had friends that was in Zulu Nation. I had Crip friends, I had blood friends, I had Latin King friends, Nieta friends, you know what I'm saying? So, but I'm nothing, you know what I'm saying? I'm regular, my crew, we most hate it. That's like my, my childhood friends and now that just became my crew as we growing up. But high school was cool because when I got to high school, all right, to, to, to show you the Harlem influence. When I got to high school, ninth grade, I had braids, like box braids. I was still on crisscross shit. Like I had box braids and probably two hoop earrings as a freshman. By the time Easter came around, I had a waves, waves in the Caesar with, with two, two uh, little diamond studs. That was the Mace effect. You understand what I'm saying? So high school is probably where High school is probably where I, I began to be like, maybe I could be a rapper. Before that, it's like, damn, I just listen to rappers. I got posters on my wall that I ripped out of the Source magazine and shit like that. You cut them, you know, off the radar. Like maybe one day I could be an off the radar. And then one day you went off the radar. So now it's like, damn, maybe some, maybe somebody somewhere is cutting out my off the radar, putting it up on the wall. Like, damn, one day I could be like Jay Mills. So real talk, I was a super fan. I'm talking about, I used to record videos. Like my moms might have recorded like Keith Sweat on Apollo and Teddy Riley and Guy on Soul Train and she don't watch it no more. But I'm watching Rap City and Cam just did the freestyle where he was counting the money or LL was sitting on the toilet or or Lil Wayne, and or, you know what I'm saying? Or, or, or Gilly and Major Figures was in there. I'm recording shit like this. And then when my homie, am I lying, Dre? They come over to the crib, we order Chinese food and we watch all the shit I recorded last week. It might've been some shit from Video Music Box from Ralph McDaniels. It might've been some shit Big Tigger in the booth with somebody. Shit might've been Freestyle Friday. You know what I'm saying? But I was one of them kids that was a fan of it that much. So when you get to high school and now it's like, oh shit. They don't know my name at the table with the seniors, but they call me Harlem World. I'll take that. I'm a freshman. You know, when you're a freshman, you just want to be accepted. So once you accept me to the cool table, and my man Walt from Black Ink, shout out to my man Walt from Black Ink. When I got the art and design, he was a junior. So I used to be shy. I used to just like rapping to my friends. And he took me to the table. He took me to the cool table where the seniors is doing the beats with the pen and a, and a, and a quarter. And then once you start doing that type of shit, it's kind of probably built confidence. If I could say anything about high school, it just fully built my confidence. I went in a fan and I left like, I'm gonna make you my fan, you know? And you graduate high school? Did you graduate yeah, high school? Yep. And do you just Let me go, keep this a you, buck though. Let me keep this a buck. I didn't graduate from the high school of art and design because I started fucking up so much. I woke up one day and I told my moms, I was like, cause I had a record deal when I was in high school. People don't know that. I got a deal when I was 17. I've been in the industry for at least 23 years. And I'm just talking about from the high school shit. I'm not talking about when I first met my son and all of them at 15. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about when I got a deal at 17. Like my mom's had to amend my contract because I was under 18. I woke up one morning and I was like, Ma, I don't want to go to school no more. And she was like, uh, what you mean you don't want to go to school no more? You waited till you a senior to drop out? And I'm like, yeah, I got a record deal. I was one of them, you know, you want that type of shit. I got a record deal. Like, what, what I need to graduate for? Like, and I remember she said, you know what? If you want to be a fucking idiot, that's on you. She cut the light off, closed the door, and took my brother to school. And I felt so crazy laying there, like, on some bum shit. I probably woke up at, like, 10, 15 and went to school, third period. And then I transferred myself out of art and design and I went to West Manhattan. 
So I got to shout out everybody I graduated with from West Manhattan. You know what I'm saying? But I went to art and design, but my senior year, I transferred and graduated out of West Manhattan because I wouldn't have never graduated out of art and design. You start, I got a lunch, I got a program card for fourth, fifth, and sixth period lunch. I don't even know what's my real lunch period no more because I'm in everybody else's lunch period rapping at the back table. I had to get out of there. <laughs> okay, you, were, you wasn't really focused on school. It was Fuck, all music. No, I had to get out of there. I'm glad I got out of there. Okay, so you graduate, and what do you do? What do you do with yourself? Do you just go full blown music, hip hop, or do yeah. you try to get a job at any point? Nah, man. When I graduated out of high school, I got accepted to NYU. But I, I, I want you to go into my mind. You know what I'm saying? So remember when I said I was going to night school at Washington Irving? Now Washington Irving is like downtown New York City, Union Square area, like 14th Street. If anybody from New York know, they know. NYU is two blocks away from Washington Irving, like two, three blocks away from where Washington Irving was. So my ignorant ass was on some shit like, I wanted to go to Clark. I wanted to, I got accepted to like NYU and like SUNY Purchase, like upstate New York. That's not Clark Atlanta. That's not, I just wanted to go to Atlanta. I'm gonna just keep it real. When I got accepted to NYU, it's like, I'm not taking the fucking train that I just took to high school to college. Sounds ignorant. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it may sound a little ignorant, but I might have fucked up like right there. But I didn't really feel like I fucked up because after high school, I had a deal. It was a single deal. I was in a group and that was my first real taste of getting an advance, you know, getting some write ups, being in magazines, people talking about you and shit. It wasn't nothing too big, but it was big. It was everything in the world to me at that time. And it flourished. Uh, my son went to jail. You know, so you were hanging out with my son a lot at the time. Yeah, I got, I, I got shout out to my son. I got, I got down with Mice and his crew when I was 15. He had a crew called the Problem Children. He was the problem child. He had a crew called the Problem Children. It was like eight or nine of them from the Bronx, and it was one girl, but it was like eight or nine of them, like a bunch of dudes. They was all nice, but I was kind of the only one from Harlem, and I was kind of like forced on them. I don't really think. Uh, if it was up to them, they would have just took the little 14 year old from Harlem and made him a part of their Bronx because they was like a family. They was like a real crew. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like uh, my manager kind of just like put me with them because he was managing mice. and He was managing everybody. So he kind of put me with them. Um, my son was signed to Violator and he was like the Rough Rider compilation was out. Violator compilation was out. Mace album. He was on Mace album. He was like flourishing. Oh, he was on Mace's second album. Yeah, Mace was flourishing. He was on the, the From Scratch joint. He was on the Hood joint on the Rough Riders compilation. The Truth on the Violators joint. He, he he was on a few joints. He had a lot of lot of shit going. Mixtape shit. Battling. That was another thing. Uh, and then he caught, the, he caught the case and then he went to jail and it kind of like shifted things around for the label. You know, the whole production team and everything. And around the time I was 19 is when the no, no, no shit came about. That was like my first solo deal. But in between there, they was kind of like just molding me to be like, you know, the J Mills that I became. Battle, aggressive battle rapper, a lot of freestyles, uh, name everywhere. You know, at that time, that's really like the, the mode I was in until probably for like two years after high school. And then by the time I turned 19, that's when I met Scram in the studio. He played me the no, no, no beat. I know this shit sounds like it's moving fast, but once I met Scram, he played me that beat. I did the song the next day. I had a job. You know what I'm saying? I was working on like 33rd and Park Avenue in like a medical malpractice office. I'll never forget. I wrote no, no, no on my lunch break on a brown paper bag that was from a lunch special from a Chinese restaurant. And I did this shit in the studio, kept going to work for like the next week. And... Yeah, when DJ Enough was playing the record, shout out to DJ Enough. He played it on Hot 97 for like a week. And then I got a deal, a solo deal. And it was crazy because the solo deal, the advance was so much more than the group deal I got for the single deal when I was 17. So it was like culture shock. It was just like, oh shit, this is different. Like I kept going to work. And when I remember when I signed the deal, like, cause you didn't get, you know, you don't get the check for a minute. You know, you don't just sign and get your check that day. Well, at least not in that time. So had to wait a few weeks so I remember I kept going to work <laughs> and shit wasn't real to me yet it wasn't real to even with hearing yourself on the radio and excuse me hearing yourself on the radio and 
doing the champagne shit and the contracts and all that, it still wasn't real to me. I didn't have no bread. I was still going to work, getting on the train, going to work, tucking my shirt in. But when that advance came, that shit changed everything. <laughs> that was it. No more going to work. The, the, not my first rap advance, but my, my first solo rap advance changed everything. Like... You sign your advance, and do you, and No, No, No takes off? Yeah, No, No, No took off immediately. Okay, did this hit Billboard, I think? Yeah, yeah, okay. it hit, funny shit, I just found this out last year. I always thought it was just a mixtape record, not a mixtape record, but it just never really, like, reached the success I thought it should. But No, No, No actually hit, I want to believe, like, 42 on the Billboard. But I'm like 19. I'm not even paying attention. And you didn't even know? Didn't even know. I probably Damn. just found it out like last year when I was uh, uh, ordering my plaques. Damn. I'm ordering Young Money plaques. I'm ordering plaques when I was on Young Money and when I was on like Lil Wayne album and shit. And I just see like, Jay, I'm like, let me search No, No, No and Streets Melting and my swag and all that. I'm like, oh shit, this shit was number 42. Oh shit, I was number 70 something. I said, like, and I always tell people, just because that shit is not a number one plaque don't mean you shouldn't hang it up on your wall. You know what I'm saying? Like, my kids wasn't born when I came out with no, no, no. But every day they go to eat dinner or they walk past them plaques, they see your accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? They wasn't alive for it. But as they grow, one day they'll ask, Daddy, who's that in that picture? Or what's, what, what album was this? Who's, you know, it, it's, it, it's like accolades. It give you, like, stuff to talk about. And at one point you ended up on making of the band. Yeah, I ended up on making the band. Uh, how did I end up on making the band? I'm trying to make sure. Damn. I, okay, at that time, one of my managers, my man Naj, he was, uh, you know how people always be in the studio sessions having dice games and talking, uh, debating shit. You know, my man better than your man, my little man to kill your man. So something came up about... I guess they was in the Daddy's House studio. That was Puff's studio at the time. And I guess son came up like, oh, my man Mills would kill, kill everybody in the house on that show. And Puff was like, all right, well, bring him through. I'll make him battle everybody in the house. You know what I'm saying? And then my other manager was like, nah, we ain't going to do that. Pick the best person in the house. You know what I'm saying? And well, but you got to remember at this time, I, and I want to shed light on this, the band wasn't created yet. By the time, I know production now. So I know we might have filmed that shit in January. It might not have came on to November. The band wasn't formed yet. They were still like trying to see who was going to make the band. So when Ness battled me, he wasn't in the band yet. And that's why if you notice, you see Mysterious and Freddie. You see all sorts of people standing around that never really made the band. So that was kind of like his uh, proving ground for him. Like he kind of had to come out here and go crazy. And he did. They edited it however they wanted to edit edit it down, whatever. But I ended up going down there that I don't night. Know, but the first time I seen the first time I got in, seen you or heard of you, you just destroyed some dude in front of Puffy, man. Okay, that was uh, I think that was like had, that uh, was a Smack DVD. Okay, that was Sia Castro. The, okay. uh, that was the first Smack DVD I ever did, and I think that was that was after the Ness battle, and I I, I remember how. Because when I bat, I had already knew Ness. Shout out to Ness. I had already knew Ness through my man Dao from Harlem, right? Shout out to Dao. He put me on with uh, Ness. So I knew him before I battled him. We had got kind of cool before I battled him. and But we had the battle. Like, you you can't say, oh, nah, this is my man, Puff. I ain't about to battle him. And I wasn't about to tell Puff that because <laughs> I wanted to prove myself. He knew me since I was 14, 15. I ain't 14, 15 no more. Shit is a little bit different now. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to prove that. So if you look at my battle with Ness... I'm very calm. I'm not talking a lot of shit. But when I rap, I'm going crazy. And then I just stop and I look at Puff. You know what I'm saying? So by the time I battled Cy Castro, I remember after I battled Cy Castro, when he stopped it and everybody went back and we went upstairs back in Daddy's house, he was taking his jewelry off at the pool table. Everybody who been to Daddy's house know that infamous pool table. He taking his jewelry off at the pool table. This is Diddy. And he was like, yo, I was asking him when we went downstairs, like, you sure you want to do this? Like I seen, I seen kid get busy before. He's nice. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a ride with you because you hard artists. I'm riding with you, but you sure you want to do this? Cause I, I seen, I, I not, I don't know how busy you get, but I know Mills get busy. He said Side Castro was like bet. And shout out to Side Castro because he was, he was nice. I don't want people to think he was just like, am I lying, Dre? They was, 
like Cy Castro was, he was that dude at that time. So, but when the DVD came out and they saw my battle with him, people just started trying to clown him like he was never nice. So I want to shed light on that. Cy Castro, he, he used to get busy, but that's how the, uh, the Ness battle came about with me and Ness. And from there, that's when the smack battles came. What were things like with Puffy when you were going through all this? Nah, it was cool. It, it was, and shout out to Diddy. It was never no issue. Uh, Puff and one of my managers at the time is like family. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of, that whole situation with Smack and Puff and me, uh, that shit was just timing. None of it was planned. We ain't know how big Smack DVD was going to be. I had been doing battles in the street like that. It was just somebody happened to pull a camera out in the midst of it. Like, I was already Jay Mills when you saw me. Like, by the time y'all saw me on Making the Band and Smack DVDs, I was already, like, that off camera. Like, everybody in the city knew that. Everybody in the labels knew it. But I was just kind of like the mixtape battle rapper. I cut. No, no, no was like a joint, but it wasn't like, I mean, this shit ain't put it on me, Ja Rule. Like, this shit ain't, you know what I'm saying? It ain't, it ain't that. But I was always on their mental. I was always in, on their radar. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And now you've, you know, you you probably got a pretty good buzz going. Yeah. Yeah. I you was. Know, everybody knows buzz. who you are. Are you still with the label? Have you, you know what I'm saying? At what when, point? At what, you, at what point, you mean? And what label? Okay. Well, you had your solo <laughs> deal. Did, you, did that not last long with the No, No, No joint? No. My solo deal with No, 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 I was on Warner Brothers. So that lasted for about a year and a half, two years, close to it. And then from there, I went. What happened with it? Just didn't work. I think at that time they was trying to do, uh, they was trying to get into the rap shit more. And it wasn't, like it was like me, Lil Scrappy. You know, I remember Lil John had uh, B and me over there. It was like Trillville, Lil Scrappy, me, they had like a couple other people, but it was it was like we just trying to get our rap shit popping again, like right now. I remember like Tom Wiley had just came over there from Interscope. It was like it was musical chairs time. So I kind of got caught in that and shit just didn't work. And they let me leave with my like with everything. Like they let me leave with my mask, like, well, just take your shit. I guess they <laughs> I guess my my big homies and all that, they must have made so much fire in the office. They was like, you know what? You can keep all of the music, the masses, everything. Just go. We don't want no issues. So they took me back, which was my all right, my my first deal when I was in a group was at Motown. It was a single deal. I told you it was a single deal. Then I got the deal for No 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 with Warner Brothers. Now I'm out in Cali a lot. I'm I'm experiencing that. I had never been in California, but now I'm coming to the Warner Brothers office in California. They got me staying up in the city walking. You know, it's just like, oh, this is different. Then I go back to Harlem. So when that was over, I went back to Universal. Shout out to Keto Massenberg. He was just about to leave Universal. And my man just had a real good relationship with him. And had a real good relationship with him because he had gave us our single deal when we had the single deal. So he uh he gave me my deal before he left Universal. Like he just he just kind of like did some shit like yo I'm a Mills got some shit and he looked out he gave us a situation at Universal and I know what your next question is so what happened with that situation what happened with that situation was Sylvia Rohn came over to Universal I always get caught in some musical chair shit Sylvia Rohn came over to Universal and Tone and Tone from Trackmasters and Eric Nix and Shanti Das and shout out to all of them because they tried their hardest. <laughs> like when I say Eric Nix, uh, Shanti Das, you know what I'm saying? Like all, Steve Rifkin, and I'm gonna tell you how I ended up there. Sylvia Rohn came over and clean house. She was dropping everybody. I remember she came over and dropped the Franchise Boys. And they took that same album and went and got with Jermaine Dupri and came out with, oh, I think they like me. Yup, in my white teeth. Same album. And they just put the Brat Bow Wow and Jermaine Dupri and all of them on it. Damn. So so I wouldn't get dropped. We asked, could they put my project on SRC with Steve Rifkin? And Steve Rifkin was like, cool. You know what I'm saying? That's how I got with SRC. And that's how I was putting out uh, Who and my swag. And you know what I'm saying? All of that shit. It's whatever with Fat Joe. Bring it back. 
the statue, like all of that shit was SRC, like Steve Rifkin, like I believe in you. But it's like we went over to Steve Rifkin and little did we know he still got to go back to Sylvia Rohn to get the last word. So it's kind of like, this is a fucked up situation right now. You know what I'm saying? Then we would go in there and ask for certain shit. We would ask, <laughs> I don't want to throw nobody under the bus, but we would ask for, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We, we would ask, well, you know, you, you're an artist and you got a wish list for your remix. I want to get this artist in the way. She was like, I was thinking more like, uh, oh, no. so and you'd be like, oh, that's what you think of me. Like, okay. So at some point we just decided that this ain't going to work and then got up out of there. And then ironically, my next situation is Young Money, which you still got to deal with Sylvia Rohn. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But shout out to Sylvia Rome. I don't when I was younger, I used to take a lot of shit personal. But then as I got older, it's like, man, she done dealt with so many artists before you and after you, bro. You ain't you ain't the reason that she lose no hair or she lose no sleep, bro. You know what I'm saying? So she shouldn't be the reason that you lose no sleep or you lose no hair. You know what I'm saying? It's business. And that was that. Okay, and so at, at one point you do link up with Young Money. How does yeah. all that come together? I link up with Young Money because when I was on SRC, uh, like I said, I was just throwing shit out. Uh, bring it back with uh, Lil. I mean, bring it back with Kiss. And you know, just being from New York, man, I come from that remix era, and I'm like, damn, I got to keep the record going. You know, like I got to keep the record going. Funkmaster Flex, shout out to Flex. He put the record on one of his albums and gave it a little more traction. He was doing car shows and shit, so that gave me a reason to, oh, Jay Mills performing live at the Funk Flex car show. Good, you know, good promo. As I got older, I'm like, damn, that was, that was dope that he did that. Good look, too. Gave the record more of a push. And I had a remix, and we got Fab on the remix. Shout out to Fab, we got Fab on the remix. Reached out to Fab, he came through, did the remix, and we was like, damn, we need, we, we need, who else can we get on it? Or should we just keep it with Jay Mills featuring Fabulous? And then I was like, fuck it, let me hit Wayne. You know what I'm saying? I hit him and he was like, yo, come to the studio. Did you already know him at the time? Yeah, I knew him. I knew him through because we was both on Universal. So I knew him through seeing him at All-Star Weekend, Memorial Day Weekend, Labor Day Weekend. And I used to do shit like, I used to meet people and be like, yo, what's good? My name's Jay Mills. Because I'm, I'm was, a, I'm a fan first. This shit, I was... I, I'm fresh out of high school and now I'm 19 at Luke parties and shit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so to, to me, I would meet people and be like, yo, what's good? My name is Jay Mills. What's good? Not even knowing I might have met this person two or three times, but they might not remember me. So I'm going to make sure you remember me. Just, you know, <laughs> I remember we was, we was in All-Star Weekend in Houston. And I remember we was going in the club and I saw Wayne. I gave him a death. He's like, what's good? I said, what's good? You know, J Mills. He said, man, I know, who, I know who you is, man. I know who the fuck you is, man. Like, and I was like, oh, all right. I just laughed. And that was the last time I did that. I'm lying. I did it again. And D-Ray did this. D-Ray Davis did the same shit. Man, I know who the fuck you is, man. Stop telling me who you is. I said, all right, that's, I got to retire. I'm J Mills. That shit is a dub. <laughs> shit is over. But I had knew Wayne before that. And I reached out to him. He told me to come to the studio. And he did it on the spot. Did this shit right on the spot. Free? Free. Okay. And we paid Fab, too. Shout out to Fab. That's not no funny shit. But I, we would have paid Wayne, too. Because in our, in our minds, and when I say we, I mean like me, Tone, Naj, like Warner Blow, the, 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 the team that I was with at that time. Niggas would have paid uh, Wayne, too, if that's what it, what it came to. But he was just like, and I'm not saying Fab charged us. Like, it was like, no, at that time, everybody was charging everybody. But it's just sometimes people would be a fan and just be like, send it. You know what I'm saying? I can't be mad at Fab if he getting his bread. Like, I'm sizzling right now. This nigga is Jay Mills, but he ain't on my level. So for me to bring him up to my level, it's going to be a little fee. That's fair business. There ain't nothing wrong with that. So we didn't look at it. It was like nothing wrong with it. And from there, I built a relationship with Fab. You know what I'm saying? I like came to the studio and did the verse. And I remember going back to the block. I remember coming back to the block like, yo, this nigga Fab is one of the funniest niggas I've ever met in my life. Like, this nigga got wild personality. Like, yo, I wish y'all niggas would have been in the studio last night. And that's how I got cool with Fab. So sometimes it's business that takes shit a little bit further. And sometimes it's just people be a fan of you. Wayne was like, come to the studio. Crazy thing is I went to the studio and he was already rapping over the beat. 
like he was doing a freestyle tour with Jewels, I guess for Can't Feel My Face or something. I'm like, yo, this the beat I was coming to the studio to get you to rap on. He's like, word? I bet I rap over it again. Oh, shit. I remember when he doing it, I'm sitting in the room with Currency. This is like my first time being Currency. Shout out to Spitter. And he's explaining to me the whole Hurricane Katrina shit and how he went to sleep. It was raining. He was like, fuck it, I'm going to go, out and add, go upstairs, some weed. So I woke up in the morning and I had a convertible outside and I just saw the rear view mirror. This is all he's telling, Currency is telling me this about Hurricane Katrina in the lounge as Lil Wayne is in the booth rapping over my shit. And we still don't know if he gonna charge us or not. <laughs> we just like, oh, this is about to get an invoice. This is, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> what was gonna happen with this. And he never charged me. And I think that's what led to me getting with Young Money. That's what led me to put my pride aside and ask him, like, what's up? Because he did another verse for me again after that. Yeah, I had a song called Highlight of Player. After the whole Bring It Back remix with him and Fab, uh, I ended up leaving SRC. Not because of anything with Steve Rifkin, not because of the music I was making. I was making dope music. I had records with Swiss Beats, Scott Storch, Wayne, Fab, Fat Joe, T.I., everybody. So it wasn't the music, it was the business, you know? And that was my first taste of, you could have some dope ass music, you could do all the interviews, you could do all the promos for the big dog pit bulls and the heavy hitters and the core DJs and TJ's DJs and Felly Fell and Flex and DJ Enough and DJ Irie, you know what I'm saying? Greg Street, you're doing all of this shit. But and you're on these promo runs. You're going to sit with the PDs. You're going to eat fucking Papa John's pizza in the office at the radio station. And these people don't really give a fuck about none of that shit. They just want to, it's free lunch. Free lunch on Universal today. I used to feel that shit when I would get to certain states. You know what I'm saying? So that was my first taste of that. So when I got out of that whole Universal situation, I remember I had a song called Holla at a Player. Recorded the shit in my mom's crib and all that. Because now I'm back in the hood. Recorded the shit in my mom's crib, and I sent it to DJ enough. He just was playing it for me. And I'm like, damn, I ain't got no deal enough, and he just spinning this shit every day. But now I'm smart enough to know that shit ain't free. Not saying like I gotta pay DJ enough, but that's a budget out of your deal for radio and spin. You know, you don't even have a deal right now. Like, so who's You mean it's gonna come back later? No, I mean like when you get a record deal, you have a radio budget, you have a recording budget, you know, you got marketing money, you know what I'm saying? They got money to spend at radio for this quarter. They got, so if I don't have a deal, where's my radio budget? So now this is letting me know whoever's playing it, they playing it on the love. Ain't no budget. It ain't no label to call you. It's just. And on top of that, he's playing yours for free when he could be pay playing someone he's getting paid And for. I'm just sending this shit straight from my Gmail, from my mom's crib on a power book. Not a MacBook, a power book. G4, power book G4. This is before they was even making MacBooks. But who else gonna do it? I'm smart enough, I done been through the Universal, the Warner Brothers, the Motown, the SR. I done been through it enough to know, oh, if you don't have nobody to do it, it's nobody gonna do it. So now I'm sending my shit to all hip hop. I'm sending my shit to Nah Right. I'm sending my shit to Hot New Hip Hop. I get a relationship with DJ Ill Will. Oh, you run Hot New Cool, now I'm sending. This is what I'm doing for my crib. You know what I'm saying? And I hit Wayne, like, yo, I got this highlight of player song, bro. You know what I'm saying? If you want to get in the remix, bet, send it to me. Fuck it, let's just send it to him. Let's see. He might, he might not charge me nothing. Let's just see. He ain't charged me nothing before. Now I'm, I'm being a straight Harlem nigga. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you give me an inch, I'm taking a fucking football fill. Like, nah, I'm, I'm definitely overstepping my boundaries. Like, Mills, I already did a verse for you for free. Can I get another one? Yeah, send it. Make a long story short, he did it again. Didn't charge me. This is when he's doing 400 songs in a year. This is like the height of Lil Wayne. Oh, he must fuck with me. I know this ain't for everybody. This type, of, this type of respect ain't for everybody. Yo, I wanna, I wanna ask you something, cause now I gotta put my pride in a cup, swallow it. Fuck the pride, my nigga. Let them know your situation. Let the nigga know you up in the hood with no deal. But you ready to work. Make another long story short, the next day, I was on a flight going to Miami. Mm. That night, I was in the studio in Hit Factory with him 
and Tez having a conversation. Next week, I was on a roll with Lil Wayne. That shit happened. It, it, I know sometimes these stories I'm telling you, it sound like, that shit ain't just happening like that. It happened just like that. And at some point, shit does slow up. You know what I'm saying? But so when he it, was just starting Young Money at the time. I probably got with Young Money. Mm, 2007, somewhere around there. 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. But it wasn't really what it what it became to be. It wasn't that at that time. It was kind of just like us traveling with Wayne. You know, Jazz was around, but Drake wasn't around yet. Like, he hadn't brought Drake around yet. Like, Nicki was still with, you know, doing come up DVDs and stuff like that. It might have been fucking with Deb and French and Gucci. Tiger might have been with the gym class heroes. You know, Corey Guns might have been with Nick Cannon. We wasn't all, it wasn't all like that ball of fire, young money, every girl in the world just out the rip. That shit just grew. It just grew across time, like doing Dedication 3. That was probably some of the first shit I ever did. Like when y'all heard me on Dedication 3, that was probably some of the first sessions in Hot Beat Studio in Atlanta that I did with Wayne. Okay, so now you're signed and you go on the road and so you're one of the first members of Young Money. Nah, I'm, I'm never going to say that because then I'm going I'm to I'm get some flack for that. The first members of Young Money was the squad. Squad up. Okay, who was that? Uh, it was Gutta Gutta, Kid Kid, Mario, uh, Soup, and Wayne, I, T Streets. Damn, man, I hope my I hope my boys don't kill me, man. But I think I got it right. I, I might fee. I might be missing one or two people, but those were the rappers of it. Like if anybody know Wayne, they know Squad up. So for Jay Mills to say he was one of the original members of Young Money, that wouldn't be solid. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be keeping it a buck. So they was the original members. Um, I think that dissolved, and that's where like Currency and Mac Main came in. And then when Currency, that's when Currency and Mac Main came in. And then I think that's when he started putting together what you seen as Young Money for like We Are Young Money with Corey Guns, Jay Mills, Nicki Minaj, Drake. You know what I'm saying? Little Twist, Little Chucky. You know what I'm saying? He just started forming it together. But Squad Up was definitely like, that was the foundation of Young Money. Like Wayne put that together out the rip. Okay. See, look, now look. See how I could have just glazed over that? I didn't even have to tell you that. But that's just me. I could have sat here and been like, oh yeah, I'm one of the original members of Young Money. You know, I was one of the first. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. You could have just been like, yeah, I was one of the first ones. And, yeah, that's corny. That's corny. You know? But in it, I just wanted to point that out that that's what niggas do. Niggas are glaze over your whole fucking history and act like you didn't even exist. That shit is whack. And I, I ain't never been one of them niggas. Shout out to the whole squad up. Shout out to everybody that was ever a part of Young Money. No matter what chapter you was, we all a part of the same fucking fraternity. <laughs> and at one point, Drake. Yeah. Comes in, Drake and Nicki come into the picture. Yes. How, do you know, were you around or how oh, did yeah. all that come I together? When, uh, I probably came around like a little bit, probably around the same time. It was all around the same time that way. I don't know who was first or whatever, but I do remember that when Jazz was trying to get Wayne around. He probably had been trying to get Wayne to listen to Drake way before any of us got around, but Wayne just probably wasn't on it and doing a bunch of shit. So I do remember when Drake came around. I remember when, I think Nicki was probably was there before me. Not like solidified, but Wayne was fucking with her, you know what I'm saying, before me. He was, yeah, he, he was trying to fuck with her. Um, I believe there was a flight, a commercial flight or something. With what? When you first, when you like, you and Drake first kind of uh, talked or exchanged headphones nah, with that, your music? I remember, or? We was, I remember we was on a flight. I forgot where we was going. And um, he had like some, he had like some pods. And he was like, yo, here, take one of, take, take my headphones and like, give me your headphones. And like, like, let me hear some of your shit. Like, you can listen to some of my shit. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. I've never had nobody do that before. We were on a flight, we got a few hours. So he was listening to my shit. And he was like, he was like damn, man. Now, at this point, I never watched Degrassi. So I'm looking at him like he's the light skinned nigga from Canada that sing and rap that Wayne was telling me about. But nigga's really nice. Like, I never watched Degrassi, so I don't really know. And I remember he started telling me, like, yeah, man, 
It used to be times I used to be on the grassy and I used to just go off to the side and listen to the statue. And I was like, the statue? What's that? <laughs> the, 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 the statue was a, a song that I had did and I had a video on Smack, on a Smack DVD. Like after I kind of stopped like doing the battles, this is like when Smack used to have like, you know, bring his camera and film you rapping and turn it into like a video for the DVD. So I had a song called The Statue. That's why I called myself on the on the DVD. And he, he quoted like a bar to me when I said, it's like looking for the back of an earring on a beach. Like, like I said some shit like that. And he said it to me and I was like, damn, he be paying attention. But as I'm listening to this shit on the fight, I'm like, damn, he got some dope shit. You know what I'm saying? I don't think the game was ready for that yet, but he made it where it's like, even if you're not ready, you have nothing. You can't escape this. You know what I'm saying? So I was, did you see... Like Drake yes. becoming Drake at no. that time? No, hold on for a minute. I didn't see him becoming Drake. We knew. Like, we knew. Oh, so you knew he was... No, we he knew. Had something special going no, on. No, we knew. We might not have been like... You know how people used to say shit like, oh, he don't really got the style. Like, he, you know, he dressed corny. He don't really got no... But the music? Like, when I heard... Forever and stunt hard and remember when I came back off the road, I came back, I flew back in and Wayne was on tour bus and he was like, Yo, I wanna let you hear some shit. He let me in successful. I was like, damn. I listened to the bars, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, like, man, you nice. You know what I'm saying? Like, nice, nice. I remember when Jazz first played us so far gone. You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't we knew, but I mean when I heard So Far Gone, I'm I looked at gutter gutter, I said, My nigga, we in trouble. <laughs> Like, I'll never forget when I heard Lust for Life and Ignorant Shit and I've Got to Be Unstoppable. I just remember hearing all them shits and being like, and I, we knew it with Nicki too. You know what I'm saying? If anybody was paying attention, you knew Nicki was going to pop. Like, girls like Nicki and she rapped like a dude, but she wrote her shit. That's what made Nicki stand out. Nicki wrote her shit. We knew what it was with Nicki and we knew what it was with Drake. The same way everybody else knows. How did you feel though? You know what I'm saying? You got so you got Lil Wayne, Drake, Nicki, and even Tiger. You mean like to, in the beginning, or you extent. or you mean like when the success came? Because at the beginning, it at was the, at it, the beginning. It nobody really. It was like it's kind of like you're just happy to be here. You know what I'm saying? We all happy to just be getting a chance type shit. Like at that point, but when you really get into the logistics of it, uh. You more so just think you waiting your turn. You working, you working to get your shot. You working to get your chance. You putting out music, seeing what stick. You know what I'm saying? You being supportive. You being, you know, and you gonna get your shot. But then you look up and <laughs> niggas be two, four, five albums in. You know what I'm saying? And you like, hold on for a minute. But this is one thing I wanna I wanna specify to people, cause I don't never want people to feel like I be salty about my young money experience because I I wasn't like. Bedrock just hit seven times platinum. That's fucking nuts. That's nuts. And and my my analogy for that be like niggas are try to make jokes about what level of success you didn't reach, but they don't acknowledge the level of success you did reach. You'll overlook that and go to the jokes. All right, we can get to the jokes. We'll get to the jokes. Mills never dropped the album and blah, blah, blah. You was the young money janitor. You was the, the blunt roll up. Like that, ha, ha, ha. We, I like to laugh too. But when you get to the logistics of it, Bedrock went seven times platinum. It's not a joke. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it's not a joke. You know what I'm saying? And that's no jokes no more. Bedrock did 100 million streams. It's not a joke no more. We Are Young Money debuted number one on the Billboard charts. It's not a joke no more. We are young money is platinum. It's not a joke no more. So other people will try to be like, you ain't have no success at young money. Sheik was on the Benjamins, if I'm not mistaken, right? Sheik Luch is on, it's all about the Benjamins, what you want to yep. do. You want to be baller, shocker. Sheik Luch is on the record, right? Yep. I so when it's all said and done, when Sheik Luch die, you think they're going to talk about his solo career or they're going to... Talk about him every time you put on It's All About the Benjamins. It's, it's, it's all about how you, you, you see how I just broke that down? It's all about how you look at it. Niggas are down players success. Now, yes, I would have wanted to put out a lot of albums at Young Money, but that ain't what God wanted you to do. 
you still got your success out of it. Tiger got out of it what he got out of it. Drake got out of it what he got out of it. Nikki got out of it what she got out of it. Jay Mills got out of it what Jay Mills got out of it. Now, what else you going to do with your life, my nigga? You going to sit up here and keep worrying about why you ain't put an album out that young money? Or you going to be appreciative of all the fucking years you had at young money being successful at whatever it was you were doing? That's it. You know what I'm saying? You mentioned Lil Wayne and making bedrock. I think I seen somewhere that he took less so everybody could have equal amounts. That's a fact. That's a fact. Uh, shout out to Wayne. Because when we was doing that We Are Young Money album, that was my first time dealing with splits. You know, like royalties and how many points I'm going to get, how many points Gutter Gutter going to get, how many points Aubrey Garm, Annika, Jarvis, call. How, how much is we all going to get? And then, you know, when they broke it down, I was like, yo, Wayne took cuts on all the songs he's on with y'all so we could all have, like, even shit. Because, I mean, he, you know, he's the biggest one at the time. But at that time... So he could have, you know what I'm saying? He could actually solid legitimately shit. Solid ask for shit. More. That's why when you asked me, was I original member of Young Money? I said, no, I wasn't an original member. Squad Up was the original members. Because you got to keep it solid. Niggas kept it solid with you. Wayne yeah. kept it nothing but solid with me. A lot of niggas might be like, yeah, but Mills, that nigga kind of like stopped you from blossoming, bro. Like that. If it was up to Lil Wayne, I probably would have put out five double albums. But it ain't up to Lil Wayne. It's a business. You still got to go back to the people at Universal that cut the checks. You still got to talk to Birdman and Tez and Slim and this one and that one. And then budgets and radio. And in the midst of all of that, Drake about to come out with Take Care. Just hold on for one quick second. Tiger got Rack City. Hold on for one quick second. We're going to get right back. We're going to get right back. Nikki just, I ain't going to lie, this Starship shit, this shit is like booming. We think she's on to something with this Marge Simpson wig. We're going to get right back to you. Oh shit, Wayne just did How to Love. Hold on for me. We're gonna get back. We're gonna get back to y'all. Trust me, Six Foot Seven is nominated for a Grammy. We will get back to y'all. Oh shit, she will. You know what? We're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna get there real quick. I'm on one. Oh shit. Now Drake is doing shit outside of Young Money that's propelling him past this. Nikki is doing shit outside of Young Money that's propelling her past this. Wayne is still Wayne. Not saying that they did anything wrong. They did what they were supposed to do. But if it's 10 to 12 artists on Young Money and three to four of them are multi-platinum successes, I don't know many labels that have it like that. I don't mean know many labels that have 10 artists and four of them are considered the best of their time. Shit, you'd be lucky to have one. To have one of Drake. on your label. You guys said You'd be three. lucky to have one Drake. To have the right. girl... Drake. So you got the the you got the the best new artist as the male, and you got the best new artist as a female, and the CEO is still fucking goat. It's hard to get to everybody. It's hard to get to the J Mills album when Nicki's on a world tour. I mean, Drake got more slaps than the Beatles. It's hard to get to the J Mills project. Nigga, I wouldn't have got to the J Mills project if I was in the office and we had Drake and Nicki Minaj and Lil Wayne. And I'm being dead fucking real with you. This is me. How much money is that going to bring me back right now? Because the Canadian is showing us some numbers. Nicki is showing us some numbers. That's all it is, bro. It's, it's reality. Some niggas don't want to deal with the reality of it. I'm old enough and I've been in this shit long enough. See, they'll try to paint me like I'd be angry. They won't show all of these clips. They'll take a piece of it and make it sound like a nigga be angry. Nah, nigga be real. I be asking niggas like, y'all think it was hard for y'all when Drake came out? Imagine what it was like wearing the same uniform. How many shots tonight you think we putting up? <laughs> Fuck is you talking about? Nigga, we on the, we on the team with fucking KD. It's Steph, it's LeBron. <laughs> It's once in a lifetime shit. I tell niggas all the time. It might be a joke. Like, I'm going to do some comedy shit one day. And this is going to be one of my sets. Like, this is going to be like one of my jokes in my sets. Pardon me. I always tell people, I know what it's like to be Eddie Jones. And niggas don't catch that. And I be like, yo, Eddie, it's not that Eddie Jones was whack. And I'm not downplaying myself. Maybe I am, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> it's not that Eddie Jones was whack. But when Kobe came, it didn't matter what Eddie Jones was. 
this, this, is, this is how it happens sometimes. Like, it doesn't matter who the fuck the shooting guard was on the Chicago Bulls once the kid from North Carolina got there. We're going to figure something out. We're going to make this shit work around him. It didn't matter who was at Young Money when Drake... It didn't matter what label Drake went to. Let's, let's say that. Drake could have went to TDE. Drake could have went to fucking Maybach Music. Drake could have went to Bad Boy. Drake could have went anywhere. Drake was going to be Drake. Best I ever had was still Baby You My Everything. You know, it was still the same song. It, it wasn't like... He was fucking Canadian. It, was, it didn't matter if he was with somebody from the South, somebody from Canada. Sometimes you get caught in that. It's a lot of niggas that was on the Cleveland Cavaliers when LeBron came. Darius Miles, Ricky Davis. All sorts of niggas was on there. Danielle Marshall. It's LeBron. At some point, none of you will be here. Yeah. What the fuck can you do about it? Like, so I'm supposed to sit back and be mad about that? Shit, man, I'm going to sit back and witness greatness like the rest of y'all motherfuckers. I just got a front row seat to it this time. I'm going to learn something. Yeah. Shit, if I ain't going to get my shot, I'm going to learn something so that when my time do come, I seen how they did it. I seen the moves Nikki made when business got wrong and she changed shit up. I seen that. I seen when business got wrong, how Drake changed shit up and just kept it moving and didn't really say nothing. I seen that. I seen when Wayne had to do it. I seen. So you get to see this type of shit firsthand, bro. You either going to learn or you going to sink and you going to drown. You know what I'm saying? I learned shit from paying attention to all of their successes. Even if I can't put that to use in music success, you put that to use in business. You know what I'm saying? Everything ain't about music. Like, music is cool, but just to be real, man, if a nigga got to listen to my song 1,800 times for me to get a sell, I mean, we're going to start figuring out some new things to bring some money in around this bitch then. Until y'all figure out what a stream is. <laughs> now, Young Money is... You know, more looked at as Little Wayne's label. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's also with with Cash Money and everybody. It's you know kind of tied together. Mm -hmm. You know, how involved was like Baby and Slim with with Young Money? How how much were they around? It was around a lot. Um, when I first got around Young Money, we used to record in Atlanta a lot. We used to record in a studio named Hot Beats, and we recorded. We used to be in there a lot, and that was kind of like. Uh, Wayne and Young Money. It's like Wayne and his crew, his peoples, his assistant, his road manager, and whatever artist he bringing around at that time. Uh, and then when we got, when we started being in Miami more, or when I started being in Miami more, they probably was already in Miami, but I used to come be in Atlanta and go back to New York and fly back and forth. So when I started being in Miami more, that's when I would notice, oh, you know, Hit Factory got this side and that side. And Birdman would be in this room and Wayne would be in the next room. So it's like, you'll be in there, Wayne would be in there smoking, recording some shit, and then he'll go in the room, Stunner was good. What you working on? Blah, blah, blah. Stunner be in there, he got all his homies, cash, cash money, the older dudes that you used to see in the videos and all that, they still with him. They in there and Wayne got his younger crews, Mac Main and Streets and Gutter and me. and So they was involved, but he never really like, it was more like whatever you want to do, Junior. Like I used to see that shit, like Wayne would be in the studio all night just recording shit. Birdman ain't never come in, turn the beat down, like I think right there, you need to, you need to change that blood. I think right there, you could have said that better. But like, nah, it wasn't none of that. It was, this is the album. And mm -hmm. then Birdman take it, this is the album. That's what we doing. He take, he give it to Birdman. Birdman take it up to Universal just like that. This is what we doing. This is the single, and we want to shoot the video next week. I seen that. I will say that Wayne is. Wayne taught me how to be your own machine to push the machine. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't got to tell Wayne to go to the studio. Same thing with me. My boys will tell you like. Wayne, Young Money will tell you, when I first came around, I used to bring my laptop with speakers, an inbox. You understand what I'm saying? Not like you could just go to Pro Tools on your desktop. No, an inbox to plug that bitch up to the computer. Speakers, laptop, mic stand, Newman, just to bring it. Because I know he'd be getting us rooms and shit. And some days we'd be in a, we might go to a city and be there for two, three days. And I mean... He might get a studio session, he might not, but I record myself. 
So I remember Gutter Gutter was like, yo, you be recording? Like, I'd be like, yeah, we could do a song right now. Because I was so used to recording at the crib and just doing shit, I'd bring my shit on the road with me. You know, and from seeing that, Wayne saw me doing that. And I went on the bus like the next day, Tez had bought him all that shit. And he learned how to record himself. And that's what changed shit. That's what changed shit because then, I don't need a studio session. Give me all this, all that shit. Get that shit for my condo now. Now the extra room in the condo is a studio so that you record all day and then go to the hit factory at night and finish that shit up. It's like a machine. It's like, damn, when you go to sleep. I remember one time, I probably said this story before, but if I didn't, we're going to say it right here. I remember one time Wayne was like, well, we was in the studio in the hit factory, and it was probably one of them days. I'm just, uh, I'm tired, man. Like, damn, tired. He's like, what you tired from? I'm just tired, bro. I'm just, you know what I'm saying? I'm just tired. I'm just, he said, yeah, but what you, hold on for a minute. Turn the music down. What you so tired from? What, what, you, what you did today that made you tired? And I'm in my mind, I'm just like, I don't think it's that serious, bro. You don't just put me on the spot. Like, I'm just tired, bro. I'm just a little. But it's like, yeah, but why? You can't tell me what made you tired? You just tired? You ain't do shit productive. You ain't make nothing out of your day, but you tired. You sitting here, and then you got the nerve to tell me you tired out of all people. You telling me you tired? Never told him I was tired again. <laughs> Even if I am tired, you better find something in you if he could find it. Nigga, if Birdman could find it and he older than all of us, he been doing this shit way longer than all of us. You better find it. I don't know what little Twist and little Chucky gonna be, but they got energy. And you don't know what they gonna be. You don't know what this gonna be. So you better find some fucking energy. You know what I'm saying? And just shit like that, you just, you learn shit, man. Like if you around, a nigga can't tell me they spent 10 years around Kobe Bryant and they ain't learn nothing. Can't tell me you've been around Jay-Z for 10 years and you ain't learned. And I don't give a fuck if he ain't never put your album out. You ain't never learned nothing. You ain't learned how to stay afloat without him putting his album out. Dre, how many cribs I had in Miami? I'm not even looking at him. How many albums did I put out? <laughs> yeah. I ain't even looking at my man. He said, I had like three. Asked him how many albums I put out. Don't even know. You know why? Because I figured out a way to live on the 48th floor. Bayshore, on Bayshore Drive over the water, no album out. Because if I could go to Paris, Switzerland, and London, and we could, Dre, we go over there, we make us a quick 20, 25 thou. You, you take five, you take seven, so I ain't got 10 when we go across the border and they'll make me fill out them papers. Once we figured that out, you ain't got to put no album out. What I need an album for? My rent paid. My, I bought my BMW. Tiger put me on to the shit out in Cali where you don't need no, <laughs> you don't need no, uh, no credit. A word? This is where all the drug dealers and shit go. I'm going to. Flatbed my BM back to Jersey. I don't care if it ain't the newest year. I don't got no note. Mm. And now flatbed it to Miami. Once you figure it out, bro, do you care if you don't have an album out, if you figured it out? I never, I never came out and said, Birdman and them owe me money. I never came out and said Lil Wayne owe me money. Figure it out. You're a hustler. And you you seen when Wayne was in a jam and how he had to figure it out. That was part of me leaving. It was part of me leaving Young Money to see a nigga got problems that's way bigger than my album. This nigga fighting for 50 mil. You fighting for an album in the streaming era. You know what I'm saying? He did all he could do, bro. It's up to you now. You got to go stand on your own ten toes and figure it out, Mills. This nigga got real life shit he going through. Like, to ask him to worry about when you coming out with an album at this time? You know what I'm saying? I got to figure it out, bro. And, and that's what I did. Now, at one point, there was like a lot of rumors or, you know what I'm saying? You would see little things about Lil Wayne going to Rockefeller with Jay-Z. And then, yeah. you know, a few years ago, uh, Lil Wayne said in an interview that Jay-Z offered him like 175000 to sign. And, you know, oh, like kinda, back in the days? Yeah. I, I think I heard something like that. 
I think was I was there any like talks of that or anything? I or? don't know. I, I was, that was before that was before my young money uh, initiation. <laughs> so I don't really know about the the specifics of that. But I did hear something about that like back in the days. Oh, OK. I did hear something about Jay was trying to sign him. Now, Wayne ends up going to jail. Yeah. Right in the middle of everything, everything. You know, you guys are, everybody's taking off, Drake, Nikki. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything's going down, you know. What were those last days like before he had to turn himself in? It was some bullshit. It was some bullshit. I'm trying to figure out if if we went to the Super Bowl around that time. I don't know. I know he took us all to the Super Bowl when it was in Miami. And I remember we went to a club one night, and he was supposed to be turning himself in in the morning. And I remember we party like crazy. Like, I still got pictures from that night. It was Wayne, Drake, Nikki, me, Mac, Gutter. Twist might have been in the club. You know what I'm saying? It was it was all of us there. I remember at the end of the night, he went to the Maybach, and we was all giving him because he was turning himself in in the morning, and we was all giving him dap, giving him hug. You know, some of us was crying. You know, he trying to crack jokes and shit and, you know, be all right, y'all got this, y'all got this. And and that was it. I mean, they took him to his crib and he was getting ready to turn himself in in the morning. And I remember it was a weird feeling. And then when the morning came, they gave him more time. They, oh, did, they did something like that or extended his joint. So it's like, damn, we was all ready for him to go in last night. We done got all these tears. I was... Well, fuck it. At least he ain't got to go in yet. But it's like, damn, they prolonged it. He was like ready to, ready to go. But one of the big things I remember about when Wayne was locked up, I remember two things. Um, I remember when we did MTV Spring Break without him. I, I, I remember when we had to go to like Mexico or something without him. And this is when Drake was, he had Best I Ever Had and Nicki was Nicki. So they was kind of like holding it down for us. They was like, the, they was the leaders of the pack. Even though we did Every Girl in Bedrock and all that, Drake was becoming Drake. Like, Nicki was becoming Nicki, and Wayne wasn't there. So we was kind of riding. They, they, they coattail. We did our Young Money set. We did interviews and all that. But I remember it was just so weird not having Wayne there to, like, coach us. It was like they set all the cheers up. It was like three cheers and three cheers. And it's like Nicki, Drake, Mac, or Nicki, Drake, Tiger, me, Gutta, Mac, Twist. And we just all sitting there ask, answering questions. And it shit just felt so weird, you know. But it didn't last forever. But it, I guess that was a time for us to grow and understand what it would be like if he wasn't here to hold our hand. You know what I'm saying? So I remember that. And I remember I got into some shit. Uh... The, what it was was irrelevant but I remember he called me from jail and I'm about I was like who the fuck is this and he's like yo this tune I'm looking like who you like you like he was like look I heard about that shit that happened man don't get that shit no attention and I was like alright he was like alright you cool everybody cool and he just went into some other shit but it was something that was on the internet at that time and he was calling me to tell me, don't give it no attention. Like, that should have be gone in like three, four days. But if you give it attention, it'll last for three or four years. I'm going to be like, hmm, cool. For my man to call me from, from Rikers? Not I called, like, like, what number is this? You know what I'm saying? Like, you took the, that shit must have really been on his mind to be like, yo, bro, listen. I'm just put you on some game right now. So... By the time he came home from jail, that's when I had moved officially to Miami. Because in my mind, I'm like, fuck it. When he come home from jail, if you right there, you know what I'm saying? Like, you could be in the mix of shit more than being in New York and having to fly back and do all of that shit. But when Wayne went to jail, that definitely put a damper on shit with the whole Young Money thing. But it made us, it made us understand that we could get a lot of shit done on our own now. Everything don't have to just go through Wayne. Like people might want to direct a video for you, you know? Like when Wayne went to jail, I remember I did Green Goblin with Chris Brown. Like got a director, had a barber there, paid him for a few hours, asked Breezy what size sneaker and jeans you wear, because I got a scene where I want us to run through the alley with the paint on our face. You mind putting the paint on your face, Breezy? All right, cool, but Came, to, I just rent two Winnebago's, I guess, one for me, one for Chris Brown, and you know, but 
if Wayne would have never went to jail, I probably would have never did that shit with Chris Brown. Not like that. You know, I remember calling Breezy like, yo, I want you to get on this song, I want you to rap. You want me to rap? Yeah, like the shit you did on Fan of a Fan with Tiger. I like that shit. Word. Hell yeah, kill that shit. He thought I wanted him to just sing. It's like, nah, I want you to do that other, like, because I fuck with Breezy as a rapper when I first heard him. Knew him since he was young. It's like, kind of got a real flow. People was mad at me that I didn't get him to sing on the song. It's like, yeah, but I'm one of the first people that believed in him to be a rapper on their song. You know what I'm saying? And Wayne was locked up. But if he wasn't locked up, I might not have did that video and all that. I might have been waiting for Young Money to do it for me instead of putting my own money up to do it. So when I was doing some research, I had seen that you talked about one time when you guys were in the studio and Kanye walks in and plays ham for Lil Wayne. Yeah. Can you kind of take me through that? I was in I was in the studio that night, but I kept like walking, like going around doing shit. So I wasn't in there like for the full like reaction. But I think when uh I think when he played it, of course, like with the baby money, the baby, like, I think that was a thing. The uh, like not knowing like if that was like a double entendre, if that was just like a bar, or if that was like a shot. I remember like that was the thing. Maybe Kanye probably didn't even look at it like that. Like I just want to play you this joint, like because every I will say this, man, it was like real, real competitive, but it grew to be that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember being with Wayne when he did the verse for Swagger Like Us. It wasn't like, oh, this nigga probably throwing some shots at me. It's like, yo, niggas is accepting me now. You know what I'm saying? For a long time, Wayne was nice, but niggas wasn't calling him to get on songs like Swagger Like Us. Niggas wasn't calling him to get on those type of records where they three or four of the dopest artists in the game and you just go get Lil Wayne. They was, they was still trying to look at Wayne like, he was the South rapper, you know what I'm saying? So when it got to a point where he was accepted in these people, now you listen into everything they say a little more. And I just think with the, I could be wrong, but I just think with the the baby money, you got baby money, that's my lady, that's my lady money. Like, I think Jay said something like that. I think that's what like probably had Wayne just like, all right, I'm good on that song. What was Wayne's nah, he reaction just, when he heard it? I heard he was just on some shit like, mm. And like walked out the room. Like, I don't know if he walked out the room like while the song was playing or like just was sarcastic. Like, you know, I caught that. Kanye, you know what I'm had, to, Kanye had to have known. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't, I, when I, you know what's funny? When I heard it, I didn't catch it. You I didn't, didn't feel like it? I didn't feel uh, like he was dissing. But you got to understand. We rappers like rappers that really, really rap and really, really get in debt with that shit. You can hear some shit and think like. Yo, was that nigga talking some, yo, he was talking to me, because I, rewind that shit back, bro, I gotta hear that again, it sounded like that nigga was talking about me. I think, I think that's what the moment was, but I don't really. And then a few days later, Wayne, this is him? Nah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't days later, it was probably like, it was on a, it was on the song, it was on a song on like one of Wayne's albums after that. It, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't like days later. Because Ham hadn't came out yet, I think, when he came to play it for oh, Wayne. Okay. He, they was just, like, working on shit. Because that was a big thing. Like, it's, like Kanye and Jay-Z working on the album. Niggas ain't really think it was real. And then it just came out. Like, I, I remember Otis came out. No, 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 no. I take that back. I think Ham did come out first. And then the Otis video came out. Ham didn't have a video, right? I don't think saying? so. I like to watch the Throne Project just to keep it a buck. Like, and were you there when Wayne recorded the, the yeah, disc back? Yeah, I remember when Wayne recorded that. I told him, I told him, I was like, go crazy. Because not like, this was my thing. Wayne always used to give me that confidence like, Mills, you from New York, so you kind of get a pass to say the shit you say. We expect you to speak your mind because we always, that's how we first met you, through battling, through a, a just... Saying, saying the shit you want to say and you stand on it. So my thing to Wayne was, well, if you felt he dissed you, it's not like, like this is, first of all, ain't nobody about to do nothing to nobody. Y'all is multi-millionaires, you platinum, he platinum. But as a platinum lyricist, claim to be the best, 
that ever did it. He claimed to be he the best that ever did it. If you feel some shit he said was aimed at you, do something about it. Not go beat him up. No, 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 that's not what we do. This is lyrical warfare. We all come from that school. But if you felt he threw a dart, ain't nobody going to be mad at you for throwing one back. You know what I'm saying? And I know he wasn't mad at him for throwing them back because they done did business and been on records after that. But that's just the lyrical, that's the lyrical warfare like that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you hear some shit. I remember Nas said, y'all don't know about my Biggie Wars. Who you thought kicking the door was for? But that's my heart. Y'all still tripping off the jigger shit. And I remember I was like, whoa, 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 rewind that back real quick. Oh, hold on, rewind that back. What'd he say? Remember the Leonardo DiCaprio shit where he eating he like that? He, he, <laughs> he pointed at the camera like that. that that's how I was like, well, hold on. So kicking the door was for Nas? But you don't think Biggie thought Nas was nice or whatever? But something made him go in that studio and do kicking the door for this nigga. Because I felt like some shit he said about me was slick. It could have been both babies on the albums. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? But that's how greats think. You know what I'm saying? So my thing to Wayne was, bro, I'm not telling you to go kill him. You're not going to go kill him, and you don't think he want to kill you. If you think the big homie tried to get one in on you, and you say something back, that's rap. You know what I'm saying? That ain't like we disrespect Hove, or we disrespect Wayne, or we... It's the same thing with Drake and Meek. You think just because Drake was beefing with Meek, niggas was like, Meek is whack? Oh, no, yeah. it's just a nigga beefing with him right now. So, of course, I'm going to take my man's side, but I'm not going to sit up here and say a nigga trash. I'm a Virgo. So, of course, I'm nas out. Super, super nas out. I just told you fucking Do or Die was one of the first albums I bought. I mean, my mom's bought me. So, I grew up listening to that Asiatic dope. Like, that's the shit I'm into. So, of course, I was probably taking Nas' side in the battle. And then I heard Takeover and I was like, oh shit. He's like, whoa, he just said, what about the, the, I heard Super Ugly, fuck Takeover. You understand what I'm saying? We heard Super Ugly, like before Jay went up to the radio and said, my mom's told me to apologize, I don't want y'all to play that no more. We come from that era of rap. Like, our shits go triple and four quattro. Like, and if you want to be a part of Bad Boy, then fuck you too. You know how crazy that was for us being kids on Lenox Avenue here and hit them up? We had never, we didn't, we didn't grow up in the no Vaseline era. You get what I mean? We was 80s babies, grimy 90s kids. Hit them up was like life changing. That wasn't that when Wayne and Jay-Z was taking darts at each other. That shit wasn't hit them up. That shit was two goats throwing darts at each other. And shout out to both of them, man. Look, yeah, through it, all of that, like through all, it was of, that, a big old through all of that, war and then they end up on God Did. Right. That shit don't be about nothing, man. It's just, it's lyrical warfare, man. I done seen it with some of the best of them, you know? Now, it's been hard, you know what I'm saying, for groups to stay together in hip hop. Yeah. You know, you guys did like a really good job of not breaking up really quick or, you know what I'm saying? Going through a and bunch of stuff cool. and everything. Everybody's still know, cool. But I believe at some point you did mention that, like, you know, Drake was kicked out once, Nicki was kicked out once. Yeah, they you know? I, they be trying to like they be trying to like chop that up and make it seem like it was. I was saying like everybody go through shit at labels, basically, bro. You know what I'm saying? There've been times that same way I said the same thing about Drake and Nicki. They left out the part when they said I got kicked out. You know what I'm saying? I can say Lil Twist might have got kicked out before. So, Mac Main might have. What all happened with the times that the Drake and Nicki had? Had it's, the it's all it's all the same shit. Like, some days you catch the boss on a bad day. <laughs> like, some days you work for Bad Boy and you catch Diddy on the wrong day. And you might get fired. You might be back around in a day or two because he realized he was wilding and it was just it wasn't really that serious. But who knows what he was dealing with that day? I missed the flight for the BT Awards. I was happy that I got back around. <laughs> so what all happened? Can you take me through that? It's irrelevant. I'm sure it's irrelevant. You know what I'm saying? Like, because for me to sit up here and explain why this one got kicked out or why this one got kicked out, they got kicked back in. It ain't, it, if it was like a story where it's like, nah, Nikki got kicked out of Young Money and she never got back with Wayne again. That shit was, at this point, we just fucking dancing in circles right now. Everybody done got kicked out of Young Money at one point. 
everybody. Every, when I say everybody, I mean everybody. I mean Lil Twist, I mean Lil Chucky, I mean Jay Mills, I mean Mac Main, I mean Gutter. Squad Up was the first members on Young Money. You didn't ever ask me what happened to Squad Up? All the members. You never asked me that. But they was the first members of Young Money. They never made it back around. You know what I'm saying? So when I tell you everybody has gotten kicked out of Young Money, I'm not trying to go away from the Nicki and Drake shit, but I feel like if I sit up here and tell you about why Nicki and Drake got kicked out of Young Money, I already told you why I got kicked out of Young Money. We might as well go to Lil Twist and Gutter Gutter and Kid Kid and let's talk about why currency is not in Young Money no more. Everybody done got kicked out of Young Money, man. And if you know Lil Wayne, some days you catch Lil Wayne on the wrong day. But I always tell people, some days you might catch Diddy on the wrong day. You might catch Jay-Z on the wrong day. You might catch 50 Cent on the wrong day. Nigga Tony Yayo said <laughs> 50 canceled the, the, the Reebok deal because they wasn't wearing the G-Unit sneakers. How you think that felt? Like, damn, bro, you just going to curve the whole deal? Yeah, because I could do that. Who, if we, who are we to tell him he can't do it if he the boss? Might have caught him on the wrong day where you walked in with some Jordans on and he like, where the G-Unit sneakers at? You know what? I'm cutting the whole fucking deal. That's how the, you know what I'm saying? That's how the bosses be sometimes. What were the studio sessions like when you were recording them early tracks? The Bedrocks uh, and... All of those, all of the, the Young Money shit, it was different times, you know? Like, I feel like when I first got the Young Money, it was the... Uh, Wayne probably recorded... It was one session. So Wayne might record all night, and when he finished, when he ready to leave, you still in there? It's like, bro, y'all got to have the rest of the session. Whenever y'all ready to leave, just... Sign, sign out. So it ain't like no time. It's like Birdman got this shit blocked out for him. But when he ready to leave, it's like, Nils, you ain't ready to leave yet? Gutter, y'all still, y'all feel like putting a verse on that shit? Like, all right, so y'all put verses on that shit and send it to me or come, to, come by the crib. He used to do shit like leave at five in the morning. Be like, y'all ready to leave or y'all want to stay? Nah, we going to stay and work on some shit. I bet, uh, work on that. And then I'm going to have the chef make some breakfast and y'all come by the crib when y'all leave here. And we would leave the studio at like 8, 30, 9 in the morning and go to his crib and eat breakfast at the long table. Right after. Now, we just left the studio. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just I'm 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 trying to, like, paint the picture for you, because at one time it's that. And then at one time it's I got a room, gutter got a room, he got a room. And then at one time it's. Shit, I ain't got no session tonight, but I know Wayne in the studio but I got two porn stars that wanted to have a threesome with me. So I could either have his threesome tonight and just wild out. Cause I don't really have to go to the studio. It ain't my session, it's Wayne's session. Or I could curve them two porn stars and I could go to the studio session with Wayne. Cause I don't know who gonna come through tonight. I don't know what he gonna work on or what it's gonna end up on. Those studio sessions is different than just sitting in there all night. Now you got a choice. When you just sitting in there all night waiting to just get on a record it's different but now that you got every girl in the world and you bed rocking you you go out in the clubs now they, they they know exactly who you are from what you're most popular for right now so you don't really have to sit in the studio all day but the fact that you are in the studio and you grinding it out it's the same way he don't Wayne don't got to sit in the studio but he there so that's what I mean is you just pick up on shit you learn you learn how to move like a machine, whether it's got something to do with music or not. Like, so all of them sessions, it turned into was shit. There, did, you know, what was like your most memorable session situation? My most memorable uh, session, <clears throat> I'd probably say Bedrock. Not because like that was the biggest record that we all did, like collectively, but because it was so much behind the shit. Like Bedrock, originally Amarion was on Bedrock. So <laughs> that's around the time Amarion was uh, a shout out to Amarion. That's around the time he was trying to work out his situation with Young Money. And was weird is Nikki wasn't on Bedrock Neva. I think it was me, me, Gutter, probably me, Gutter. Wait, I, th I think it was um... me, Gutter, Tiger, and. Wait, me I think gutter. she was on Bedrock. It was the other one. Um, nah. Every Girl in the World. Nah, she wasn't on Every Girl in the World at all. Right. And shout out to Nikki. 
because Nikki bullied her way on Bedrock. She wasn't on the original Bedrock was like Wayne Gutter. I think Drake was on it. I don't know for sure, but it might have been Wayne Gutter, Tiger and me. Or Wayne Gutter, Drake, Tiger and me. It was something like that. And I remember we didn't know who was going to get on the hook. And I remember I hit Amari on. About 2.30 in the morning. Like, Bro, you should come to the studio. Like, you might be able to get on this joint. And I think this is going to be something. You know what I'm saying? Because we had a bunch of records. But when we did Every Girl, Wayne knew what Every Girl was. I remember when we was doing it. He's like, we're going to do the video like Fantastic Voyage with a bunch of different girls, different nationalities getting out the car. And when I got to the set, the video, we did it just like he said when we was in the studio. So when we did Bedrock, he had a plan for it, but we didn't know who he was going to get on the hook. So I called Amarion, and I probably have actual footage of this somewhere on YouTube of Amarion. He like dancing in the studio, like doing some shit. And I was filming it on like the little recorder I had. And you see it's me, Mac, Tiger, all of us in the studio. He came, he did the hook, and that was going to be Bedrock, but it wasn't called Bedrock. It was called like Girl You Know. It was called like Girl, it was called Girl You Know, I think. I'm, Damn, I think it was called Girl You Know. And Marion was on the hook. And then I think when that deal didn't happen with a Marion and Young Money, I think that's when they started like trying to get different people on it. Because a few different people did the hook. It wasn't called Bedrock. It was just, he might have did Girl You Know. This singer might have did this thing. This singer might have did this thing. And when Lloyd did the, the ooh, baby, uh, when he did all of that, it was just super catchy. It was so catchy, we all was like, damn, that shit was catchy. And that's how that came. And then I remember Nikki thing was like, y'all not about to put, <laughs> Nikki thing was, y'all not about to put another single out without me on it. Like, I remember that being her exact energy. Like she flew to Miami for a few days. Like now nah, I'm coming to the studio. Like, mm -mm. nope. Cause every girl was like some quick shit. It was like, but I don't think Nikki would have wanted to be on. I just want to fuck every girl in the world. Or she's so creative, she might have spun that shit. She might have been able to spin it and, and and kill that shit. But with Bedrock, she was like, nah, y'all not putting out y'all not putting out another single that's possibly gonna be for the album without me on it. Like nah. She definitely like she bullied all of us. Like I'm getting on this, and when she got on it, it made it. It made it, it made it, it made it more commercial. Basically, Nikki bullied her way on Bedrock <laughs> for everybody that didn't really know that. And Amarion was originally on Bedrock, but the reason that made it my most memorable, not because of any of the stories I'm telling you right now, it was because Wayne taught me something that I kind of have forgot because I had been, became such a different artist over the time when I was young. My manager, Tone, at the time, shout out to Tone. This was the first record, one of the first records I ever put out. And it was me and Vado on the record. Shout out to Vado. And what I said last, what I ended my verse off with, he said that would be a, a good hook. And I, he, was, he was like, what I ended my verse off with would have been good for the beginning and the beginning would have been a good hook. Like it was like born in the jungle and raised in hell, but overall mama raised me well, been a problem since day one. And all I do is write heat, spit fire. And all I do is write heat, sun, sun, fire, and spit straight sun, sun like that. And he said, that should be the hook. And I was like, this is my man Tone. This is like when I'm young, I'm probably like 17, 18, 19, somewhere around there. And I'm like, but it's the verse. And I was so stuck on, I have a hook. I, he was like, Jay, I didn't remember nothing else you said, but I remembered that. And I used to do that a lot, like try to pick the most memorable thing out of my verse and make a hook. And then at some point I started just writing off of real life. I'm reflecting. So it's like, I might start writing a verse and get to the hook and the hook come. And then the second verse come. And then then the third verse come because I'm I didn't seen shit. I didn't lived in Miami. I'm fucking the porn stars. I used to beat my dick to now. I could rap about a whole different type of life now than I was rapping when I was living in my mom's crib, sharing a room with my little brother. You know what I'm saying? And Wayne told me some shit. He was like, yo, I think the ending of your bedrock verse should be the beginning. 
And I remember at that moment, because I'm a, I'm a heavy debater, I'll go back and forth with you all day. I'm a Virgo. I can go to the sun come up. <laughs> I can, even if the sky is blue, we'll debate about it being orange at some point. Because it's like, damn, well, how you know the sky is in orange? Mills, the sky is in orange. Have you ever been on shrooms, though? All right, then. So the sky can be orange. All right, then. So technically, I'm right. I'm one of them people. I could not argue with Wayne this night. He said, Mills, I think the, the ending, like when you said, look at how she walk. Mm-hmm, she knows she bad. Mm-hmm. I think that should be the, like, the other part. And I'm like, so you want me to reverse? I only got eight bars, bro. You want me to reverse the four and the four after I just wrote it like this for the last 45 minutes and practice it like this to go in the booth and you want me to change the whole shit? He said, Millsy, trust me. She ain't got a man, but she's not alone. Missing, hey, gorgeous. I was like, oh, shit, it do sound better. But that's not how I wrote it. You know what I'm saying? So it was always memorable to me that he was like, like, he helped me make this shit better. It wasn't like, shit, I went first on the song. I did me. I'm a nigga. If you want to say some shit like that, and cool, whatever. It was like, nah, like, like, Millsy, come here real quick. Like, I don't know if you want to do it or not, but I think if you took this, that's teamwork, bro. This is the fucking biggest artist in the world right now. Just trying to give you some game. It's not helping him. Now, it's not going to put no more money in his pocket. You're the sixth person on the fucking record. Half the time, they're going to cut your verse off on the radio. He know that. But when they buy the album and when you perform it, they're going to hear it. I want that shit to be just as amazing as my shit would be. You know what I'm saying? And that's something that Wayne always instills in us. That's why I always make sure. I don't give a fuck if I ain't put an album out on Young Money. I don't. What I learned and what I experienced there was more important than just saying I put an album out. I could have put an album out and the shit could have flopped. But let's say you put an album out, but you ain't had this type of relationship with Wayne. You ain't had this type of relationship with Birdman, Tez, or Mac Main, where you can still call him and be like, yo, I see a flyer for y'all doing a Young Money reunion. What's that about? Shit, I don't know. Some shit Drake doing. Shit, I want to be there. Hit, uh, the, I bet. I Mills, uh, Drake going to get you a flight, bro. Uh, what, send you, uh, oh, I bet. Because if it wasn't all love and you would have been out here shitting on them for years, talking down on them, saying niggas owe you something and all of that, you wouldn't have been at the fucking reunion, nigga. Fuck we need you at the reunion for after all that shit you done ran around and talked dirt about us for years. It ain't no dirt to talk about. If something didn't go right, I'll take the blame for it before I blame Wayne, before I blame Tez or Mac Main or Birdman or Slim for some shit. It was my fault. It was my fault. Now let's move on. Let's move on to the next thing. Let's figure out what you could do to make some shit better in your next chapter. That's it. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing to it's nothing to dwell on. Niggas be wanting to make it seem like it's somebody else's fault or a nigga owe you something. Once you start sitting up here talking about what a nigga owe you, they gonna break out them receipts of all them times you said you was fucked up before you got on a flight and you needed a couple of dollars before you go home or might be two months behind in your bills, you just came off the road. I know we waiting for the tour money to come in, but can I get like blah blah blah. They got them receipts too. Same way niggas be running around saying, this nigga owe me money. Nigga held me up. Nigga, nah, nah, nah. The, the, the rooms on the tour wasn't free. Even if it was a budget for it and Live Nation or whoever was paying for it, they ain't have to put your ass in the room. He ain't have to run around it. When I say Jay, you say Mills. Jay, Jay, he ain't have to do that. He at the height of his career. So you got to give a nigga some respect for that. Because I know a lot of niggas that wasn't Lil Wayne that ain't do half of the shit he did for us for their artists. Ain't take them half of the places that he took us around the world. We was on tour for six months at a time, about three different times. He ain't have to do that shit. Like, this is my shit. I'm lit. I'm the, I'm the biggest thing in the world. But not only am I the biggest thing in the world, my team is the biggest thing in the world. That shit, that shit showed us a lot because I could have been around a nigga that's like, I'm the biggest nigga in the world and y'all fall back. Nah, don't stand on the stage when I'm doing my show. Y'all stand on the side. I don't need y'all on my stage. He he was never like that with us. Same thing with the points. Coming down on your points, coming down on your points on albums for shit, that's your money. That's your livelihood for your kids and your family and shit like that. So to do that says, you want to help put more money in my kids and my family's like 
pocket. How could you hate a nigga like that? Are you still getting checks from back then? Hell yeah. They don't stop. They don't just because you might not be an artist on Young Money no more don't mean that art Young Money don't pay you. Where are we living now? Young Money don't pay you. You know what I'm saying? Like okay, who pays you? ASCAP. Sound uh, Exchange. You know what I'm saying? Like go on the road. Your merch. That's how I always ate, bro. I never put an album out. If I never put an album out, then how was I living? Sell t-shirts. Sell Lego t-shirts. When I was running around saying Lego, are y'all like that? Cool. Sell Lego t-shirts. Sell Forever Winning t-shirts. Sell Potent t-shirts. Sell J. Mills t-shirts, hoodies, hats, trucker hats, all that shit. You sell shit. You hit the road. You go overseas to Paris and London and stay over there for a few weeks. Birdman don't want none of that when I come back, and Wayne don't neither. You figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Like, it don't always have to be. And and just to make it clear, if I'm telling you about Wayne took all of these splits on the point, so that means, yes, you still eat off bedrock. So when I say this shit just went seven times platinum, obviously it's still selling. So obviously you still getting your money. If you, you know what I'm saying? Like it. Like shit, I said, man. man I never, like I said, man. Small... I never, I never, not one time said niggas owe me money because I get my money. Even though it was like a small percentage, but it, it was, was a so, small it was percentage so of a big pot. You know what I mean? It's you know like... what I'm saying? You, it's like when you hear Jay Z and them say like. Do you want a hundred percent of nothing or fifty percent of something? Do you right? Do you want one percent of Apple or like a hundred percent of some garbage? You want a hundred percent of know. the niggas selling strawberries at the exit, right. but it's my company. It's my business. It's ownership. I own this. Or you I want one percent of up. McDonald's? That's know? what's up. You know what I'm saying? So, hey man, my experiences in the industry been my experiences and I try to I try to learn from them. When I was younger, I used to play the blame game. Shit might be somebody else's fault, Mike, they fucked up. But at some point, I sleep better when I take the blame for shit. Even if it is somebody else's fault. Like I said, I'm a Virgo, I'm hard on myself, I'm an extremist. So I won't get past that you fucked that up for me. I could get past me fucking it up for myself. You know what I'm saying? I could live with that. I can't live with you fucking up my, my chance. Can't look in the mirror. This nigga fucked my shit up, man. I should never even fucking trusted this fucking clown ass nigga, man. I could have got that shit done my fucking self. That's the shit I would say in the mirror. But when you look in the mirror and it's like, you fucked that up, bro. Huh? Well, nothing I can do about that. Let's get to the next day. Brush your teeth, get it going. I sleep better like that, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, regardless of. You know what I'm saying? What what does or doesn't happen or comes out or doesn't come out. I mean, you got to live with the results. You got to live with it, bro. And you when know? I left, when I left Young Money, uh, I had already had the potent department thing going. I was working with artists and doing my independent thing. And that's what taught me. It got me more into like the shit that Wiz and Currency and, you know, all of them. Larry June, all these niggas, Dom Kennedy, Nip. You know what I'm saying? I was paying attention to shit like that. Like, damn, everything is changing so much. You kind of don't really need the label no more. You know what I'm saying? You used to need the label to put your music in HMV, Tower Records, Sam Goody. You don't need that no more. You can go Distro Kid or TuneCore or some shit. And you can have your music in the same store with 21 Savage and Drake music at. You can have your music in the same store that Young Thug music is at. With Lil Baby music at. Or Meek Mill. You can have your sitting Spotify, Apple, Tidal, same shit. When I was young coming up, I couldn't get my fucking music in the same place where the Locks and Mob Deep was. I couldn't get my music in the same fucking place where Rockefeller and Rough Riders was when I was 15, 16 years old from my mom's apartment in the room I shared with my brother on the computer that my father used. They could do it now. Do it now. You could be 15, 16 years old with your music in the same store with Drake and Lil Wayne. You know what the store is now, though? It's called Spotify. It's called Apple Music. It's called Tidal. It's called Amazon Music. That's the stores now. That's the HMVs, Coconuts, Sam Goodies. See, when I talk like this, niggas be like, oh, I nigga Mills know some shit. But they want the goofy shit for me. So I'll give them some goofy shit here and there. But just to be real, bro, just imagine if when you was 15, 16 years old, you could DM Jay-Z. You could DM Diddy. He may see it, he may not. But what's the fucking difference in making a demo tape and going down to a record label and putting it in a box with your phone number on it, waiting for him to call you back? What's the difference? 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's a, it's it's a different hustle now, man. So into different shit, man. You know, I could probably make more money doing a speaking engagement than I can doing a show right now. You might not want to hear the music I'm I'm putting out, but you might want to hear this. When I start talking like this, you'll pay me to come sit on a panel and talk like this. You might not want to pay me to come rap because you did that for the last 20 something years. What's new? What you got new for me, Mills? You know what I'm saying? So when I'm doing the Loud Opinions podcast, I got the potent merch, potent vibes only. When I got uh, working on this radio shit with my boy Dre, streaming on Caffeine, you know, back doing the battle shit, shout out to everybody at URL, Smack Beasley, those are my guys over there. I'm working on something else with URL. I can't really talk about it yet, but I'm about to go into some whole other lane with doing the battling. You know what I'm saying? You got to just create new shit for you because Are you going to be doing any more battles? Hell yeah. I got a battle coming up next month. I got, my next battle is already booked with URL. I just can't discuss it until, you know, they put it out. I just battled Geechee Gotti a few weeks ago. Shout out to Geechee Gotti. Uh, we battled in Atlanta. That was my first battle on URL. So I'm just trying to get back into shit that you know me for, but still bring you into my world with a bunch of other shit I'm doing. I could rap all day, I could talk slick all day, I could do these interviews all day. You know what I'm saying? But what's new? What else you got for me, man? That's the world we live in now. You be the dopest rapper in the world, what else you got for me? Yeah. I'm like that. I could see a nigga do a backwards windmill 360, I'm be like, all right, what else you got for me? It's like, damn, you ain't see that? I seen that, but what else you got for me? <laughs> Attention span is short, so. If I know I'm like that, I got to keep shit going, man. So that's why I'm getting more fluent on the YouTube and just dropping blogs on my page, interacting with the people, fucking with the people to give them more than just music. You know what I'm saying? I'm at the point in my career, I don't want to just give music. You know what I'm saying? There's so much more to Mills. And then music, ain't the that ain't the bulk of the money no more. You know what I'm saying? If you really try and get that bag and get to the money, you ain't out here trying to go platinum with a song and all that no more. You know what I'm saying? There's too many other ways to get money. There's too many partnerships and sponsorships. You might not even have to pick up a microphone and tell them niggas to cut the beat on to get a million dollars these days. It's different. You know what I'm saying? That's why niggas like Charles Barkley be hating on Kevin Durant. <laughs> it's different. You can't get mad at what year a nigga was born in. You can't get mad at what, what economy somebody was born <laughs> into. You know, it's different. And in 10 years, they're going to be making way more money than the people making now. Just like I was making more money than Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel and them was probably getting off their record deals and shit like that. My first solo record deal, I got six figures. My first one, I got four. My first deal, I probably got four digits as my advance. When I was in a group, on a single deal, you get four, four digits. Nice little, it's a lot to me, 17. And when you're 19 and you get six figures and you still live in your mom's crib, you don't even know what to do with this shit. I don't even got a license. I'll tell you, he was here with it for all that shit. Like, Dre, what did I do when I got a deal? All my friends, where would we go? <laughs> we, you know, shit, you know, just go hang out, go get some weed, go to Miami, you just, you know, just doing that shit. You know? Just go have fun. Because I don't know what to do. I'm still smoking weed in the staircase with my friends, so now I just buy the weed. I'm going to Miami this weekend. Y'all want to go? Well, I get like 10 rooms. There's two beds in each room, so at least like 20 of us can go. We was doing dumb shit like that at 19, just taking my friends with me. Like, Because in my mind, it's what you're supposed to do. When I seen the Juicy video and everybody was like this, when I saw the It's All Right, everybody from 142nd and Linux with the white ears, no socks. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, damn, I want to go to them islands too. So when I got the bread, that's what I did. Yeah. You you live, you know what I'm saying? You live and you fuck up and you win and you have success and you fail to the point that you could sit up here and have interviews where you could give it up like this. I ain't sitting here fabricating nothing with you, Cam. It ain't nothing to lie about. When I came in here, what did I say? I said, it's going to be the easiest interview that you ever going to have to do because I ain't going to tell you that you can't use nothing. <laughs> I'm not going to say nothing that I wouldn't say to somebody if they, I told you, I said, I wouldn't say nothing on this camera that I wouldn't say to somebody if they was here in front of me, because that's the phony shit. Like, you're not being disrespectful, you're keeping it a buck. It's a bunch of shit that I can say to be disrespectful. What's that gonna do? That ain't, that ain't, 
that ain't the, the character that I'm trying to build at this point because I'd be at Yoga Land with my kids. People be running up to you, blah, blah, blah. Nigga, this ain't Mills from 2003. This ain't the fuck you versus Mills. My daughter don't even know who J Mills is, nigga. I'm daddy. She don't know what rap is. She, my daughter don't know what rap R&B is. None of that shit. She don't know who Beyonce is. She don't know. She, that girl, Lele. She watch shit like that. Nickelodeon. I'm not pressed for my 10-year-old daughter to know that I'm Jay Mills. and She don't know what them plaques on the wall mean. Them shits, is, them shits could be paintings. Them shits could have came from Target and Walmart for all she know. But she a kid. I know what they mean. I know them plaques on the wall got her in this three-floor house. I know them plaques on the wall is the reason why her brother and her and mommy and daddy, we in this three three floor house, two car garage. We swinging a Range Rover to get the pick, kick, to get the kids up from school and all that. I know that feeling. I know what it took to get to that shit. And I know I ain't have to put an album out to do it. Not one. Just be on a few songs here and there. Make sure you got this many points here, this many points here, this many points here. God forbid anything happen to me, make sure my fiance know everything that she's supposed to get. The first week, he got this much for me, he got this much for me, this this uh, person got this much pub money for me. The last week of the month, they got this much for me, they got this much for me. These is the codes to the debit cards and this is the credit. Worst case scenario. How many niggas give it up like that? Worst case scenario, God forbid something happened, my lady know all you niggas who supposed to give her the money. <laughs> so God forbid something happened to me, she knows who to collect from every month because that's what I do this for. That's what I've been doing this shit since 17 for. So God forbid when it's all said and done, you better have something to show for yourself. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, man. Well, uh, one of the last questions, man. Um... You know, being around Lil Wayne, Young Money, and everybody, I see these rumors on on the internet or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I see people say stuff or, you know what I'm saying? Like Lil Wayne had ghost writers and, you know what I'm saying, this and that. You know, what's your thoughts on that when you see that something like that? Wayne is one of them people where if he fuck with you, he fuck with you. So <clears throat> I'm saying that to say anybody that been around Wayne know Wayne to have a beat playing, smoking a blunt, riding on a skateboard ramp, doing tricks, walk out in the parking lot, look up at the stars, keep hitting the blunt, skate a little bit, going to get going to uh the room, the little lounge, look at the highlights on Sports Center for a minute. Be like, I got it, I'm ready. Whole time be like, when the fuck is this nigga gonna start writing this verse? He was working on the verse the whole time. Go in there, uh, 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 um. I said that, man, uh, uh, you'd be like, damn. And then he'd be like, I right, load up another beat. And he gonna be doing this shit probably till the sun come up in the morning. So I never seen a person write something for him. But I've seen him be like, Melzy, come here real quick. Uh, uh, I said, uh, 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 uh. You fuck with that? Or oh, nah, man. you think I could have said something better? Or that's cool, I'm thinking too much. Bro, that shit crazy. Say that shit, I bet. Getting validation ain't somebody writing for you. If that's the case, then Wayne wrote my bedrock verse, right? Because he told me, yo, I don't think you should say it like that. I think you should take this part and put it here. And if you say it like this, so Wayne wrote bedrock for me now? Because he like reconstructed the words that I had there. Because I told that's no different than me telling Wayne, I think you should, if you say this like this, that so now Jay Mills wrote for Wayne. Because i never seen a nigga come in there and give him a record. i seen him give people records. Mm. I say this all the time. Niggas be like, Mills, you always stick up for Drake. You motherfucking right, I'm going to stick up for Drake. Because I've seen Drake give people records. I mean, like, give them, give them the record. Like, everything. Some of our favorite artists. But, Ghost wrote the whole, but the whole thing? But they'll hold the Quentin Miller shit over the quinn miller gave other people reference tracks too yeah but we just happened to hear though we so now we want to talk about all the reference tracks we wrote i mean that that we heard because i don't i don't give a fuck i'm mad that i even hear reference tracks but if you could tell me that nah drake had ghostwriters i'm like well he is a ghostwriter there goes that 
Because you're not going to tell me that. So you're going to tell me Drake never wrote for nobody? I know you don't want to start that conversation because that's stupid. Because the people that he wrote for so, said he okay, wrote okay, for. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. You get what I'm saying? Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. One second. This is no, a conversation. One, one second, one second. I, I'm, I'm not downing Drake. Drake, I've obviously, is super talented. And I'm not I, downing and I do believe nobody he, that, I do believe he writes has, his own shit. That has why, helped. I, I, I just question, though. That's music. Why, why would you have a ghostwriter when you're as talented as Drake? If somebody give you a reference track, are they, is, that, is that your ghostwriter? Well, if they wrote it. See, I'm not even going to say it again. Cause so you saw, okay, this, so, this, so you're they, saying, this is why they hung me before when I brought up Fade to Black. When I brought up Fade to Black before, they hung me. So I'm, this, so, this conversation is irrelevant. You get what I mean? Because I know you understand well, that was what a good I mean. question, though, right? Because no, well, no, I understand. I understand what I if understand you're, if what you're you as talented mean. As Drake, I understand what why you would mean. You have a ghostwriter. Do you understand what I'm saying? You understand? Remember last time when I had the same conversation and we were talking about Fade to Black? I, I remember that. Okay, so you understand what I was saying in that, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you understand what I'm saying in that, that answers your own question. If you're as nice as, why do you need? That, well, that's, that's, what a, you, that's what you just told me, right? Well, yeah, but that was like a bar or a hook, though. But the whole Quentin Miller thing was like a whole song. I get it. I get what you're saying. You know? No, I don't know. But I get what, I get it. I get it. But no, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying at all. Because if... If you feel like that about Drake. I was Drake, just curious. You know no, what I'm I get, saying? I get what you're saying. That was all. I mean, it really was just I asking. get what you're saying, but you know what I mean? People use reference tracks and help. Are you saying that... A reference track isn't a, a ghost right to me. So, to, oh, me. So, so you don't, to me. To me, a reference track isn't like you ghost wrote my song. Because if that's the case, some of my favorite rappers, like I would have to say like, damn, that person ghost wrote that song for you. It's like... No, it was a reference track. He bought me a skeleton and I took the skeleton and I made it my song. That's what writers do. That's what producers do. They bring you a skeleton and you change it and you make it what you want. You might keep certain shit. You might keep certain melodies, you know, but that's what happens. There's no different than Future with Drunk in Love. I've seen Future do the same thing. Same shit, but... If I give you this record and it got this melody, this harmony, and these words, and then when the song come out, it's the same melody, the same harmony, and the words are switched a little bit, but I gave it to you with the intentions for that. You get what I mean? Like, I wrote this, like, we basically collectively worked on this record together. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't get what the problem is. Like, did, did, you, did I sit there and write all of your bars for you and you said it? That's ghostwriting. Okay. I don't think Quentin Miller wrote Drake shit word for word and said, here, this is how you say it. Go in the booth and say this on the track that Meek Mill sent you and he's paying you money out of your budget for. Even Meek said he kind of like jumped out with that at that moment because we all we all do that. We all get reference tracks. I've got many tracks from producers and it might have had the hook on there or it might have had a, a, um, it might have had a pre hook already there and it might be like, oh, we think you can get so-and-so on this. You know how people do beats on YouTube and it'd be like J. Cole type beat, Young Thug type beat. When yeah. they bring those beats to the studio, to the artist, they tell us that. Yo, this hook, I put this hook on there and they'd be like, <laughs> like I think you could get Young Thug on this or you can get Future on this. Like, So then if I go and get Future on that record, he ghost wrote that for me. Even if he gave me melodies and all that, I changed the words. He ghost wrote that song for me because he told me who I should get on it with a melody that he made up and he bought it to me as a songwriter. I would say no, not in that situation. But I'm just, I was just asking the question. No, I, I'm, I'm no, okay I, either way. That's not I'm, a big no, deal to I'm, me. I'm with you. you. Know I'm 100% I mean? I'm with just, you. But I, I, was, I just think Drake is just so talented. No, that he would no, never no, need you can't a do that. You can't track. do that. You can't do that. You can't no? do that. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. I mean, he's one of the greatest ever. He might He might be. He got more hits than the Beatles. Right. He make like London music. He make the, I heard him on songs with Bad Bunny and all that. So Bad Bunny bring me a record and me, uh, me, uh, <laughs> and they got all of that on there. And they got the, and then I changed the words to my shit. So Bad Bunny wrote my verse. He, co he, he ghost wrote that for me. It a was a skeleton. Words? It was a skeleton. 
I mean, I, I get it. Some people just don't like Drake. I get, I get that no, too. No, I fuck with Drake. No, you can't fuck. This right here, like, you can't fuck with Drake. But I like the conversation because it's healthy. You get what I mean? So when you look at something one way and you're like, yeah, but that was only a couple words. Yeah, but that was only... So now it's, it's a word count on how many words <laughs> you can give somebody. I get it. Like Do we need I love, a word count? Uh, how yeah. many before it's considered ghostwriting? Man, look, okay. all, not all... <laughs> But the majority of your favorite artists, they use they use reference tracks. I don't think it's nothing wrong with that. I don't think it's nothing wrong with that. I haven't heard a lot of reference tracks for your favorite rappers, and I don't hold that against them. I'm I'm maybe, and it's not a Drake thing. Maybe that's just me as a rapper who has written full songs for people, has gave them a hook, has told them, yeah, I think you should just say this like this and this, or we sat at the console together and I wrote bar for bar for you and I was like nah you can't you can't start it off like that you gotta that's ghostwriting I know I know ghostwriting but I don't trip when people don't like reference track it's a lot of people that don't like to hear that this person didn't write this record some people don't like to hear that Neo might have wrote Irreplaceable and it was really a song about him telling the girl to the left to the left some people don't want to hear that or some people would be like, yeah, but that's R&B, though. You know what I'm saying? So the, the conversation go, I like the conversation because I like to hear what other people think about people writing for some. Some people think that's only a rap thing. Some people don't care. But there's R&B singers that be like, oh, yeah, but he ain't a writer. <laughs> Hold on. Before we, before we close this out, you know what's a good example of this? What we talking about? Hit Boy and Hitmaker right okay. now, right? Yeah. Okay. I like both of them. I like both of their production. I like both of their, I like both of their shit. But Hit Boy thing was, he don't make beats. Like I make beats, like hit the, hit the pads and quant, I, I, I do all of that. He's like an A&R. I wouldn't say Hitmaker's an A&R. You know what I'm saying? He's a producer, but there's different levels to producing. There's Jermaine Dupree producing, and then there's Puff Daddy producing. You know what I'm saying? There's Dr. Dre producing, Kanye West producing, Swiss Beats producing, Just Blaze producing. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people look at that. Somebody like Tank might look at it like, yeah, but if you ain't really write that R&B record, that ain't really your hit. <laughs> and we over here as rappers like, I don't give a fuck who wrote that shit, man. That shit fire. That's how they look at us. When they in the club going like this to Drake shit and we trying to talk about Quentin Miller. That's how, that's how singers look at us. That's how EDM artists look at us. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's a little different it's for hip hop. It's, 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 it's levels. With hip hop, we, we hold people to a different standard. Same way you said. Especially when you're great. You know what I'm saying? We talking about great tale. You talking about like nobody would have cared if yeah, it was just some Yeah, you talking about Drake, you talking rapper. about Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, fucking Beyoncé. You know what I'm saying? When you start talking about people that's like generational talents and shit like that, it's always going to be something. You know what I'm saying? But personally, I never really held that against people. Not even just the Drake thing. I never held, I never held it against Kanye when he said Drake wrote for him. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then people would be like, yeah, but Kanye is a producer. It's like, all right, so this nigga still said somebody wrote for him. Yeah, but that's different. It'd be like, all right, come on, man. Come on. Well, man. I, I hope a nigga never hear yeah. my reference tracks. <laughs> niggas going to hate niggas. They hear my reference tracks. They're going to be like, hold on. Mills had something to do with that one? Like, see, that's why I don't say nothing. <laughs> niggas, you look at a nigga totally different, you hear what a nigga uh, helped him with. But that's I think some of the best music come when you collaborate with people, bro. The best, some of the best. You look at some of your favorite music that you like, it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. Always. It's always a collaborative effort. Now, recently Billboard came out with their list of best rappers. Yeah, I saw that. That was crazy. What'd you think about it? That's their opinion. You know what I'm saying? I think the 50 greatest rappers or top five or top ten is always gonna change. And in the midst of three to five years, you always going to get at one time it was Big Daddy Kane, Rakim Kane, KRS-One. And then it was Biggie, Jay-Z and Nas. And then it was oh, Lil Wayne. It's, 
and it's Drake, and then it's Kendrick and Cole, and you know what I'm saying? So it's always going to change. You got people that's still going to say Pac is the best. Like you got people that's still going to say Big is the best. You know, it may change over time. Some people may say Lil Wayne shouldn't have been the number seven. Some people say Kendrick might have not have should have been the number he is, or Drake shouldn't have been the number he is, or Jada Kiss and Black Thought shouldn't have been the number they were. You know, it's all according to how you look at it. I try not to get too caught up on the list. Try not to get too caught up on the list because lists ain't nothing but one person's opinions. You might, you might, you might have your own fifty. You know, I might have my own fifty, and our top fives might be totally different. You know, it's all according to what we uh, subscribe to as listeners, fans. But now I just want to say thanks, man. Like I, I appreciate you opening your doors to me, opening your platform to me, letting me come sit, chop it up with you, and just talk about my story, my journey, my future. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm one of them people where I like to sit and, you know, have conversations with people about my, 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 my upcoming upbringing, where I'm currently at, what got me here, the ups and downs and shit. I enjoy the conversation, but I don't like it to be redundant. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to keep talking about the same shit. And I feel like if you're not living, you're not getting nothing new to talk about. Like if I could only come in here and just tell you about every girl in bedrock, but I couldn't tell you about when I left or what made me leave or how much respect I got for Wayne for even giving me a chance or telling you I wasn't the original member of Young Money. There was people that was there before me. It's paying respect, you know what I'm saying? But if you don't live enough, you don't learn enough. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I say I appreciate you for opening your platform to me, man. And it's all love. I want everybody to stay tuned with everything I'm doing. Make sure y'all follow me on Instagram at J Mills. Follow me on Twitter at J underscore Mills. Follow me on Caffeine, the real J Mills. I got a new show on Caffeine, the potent show. Make sure y'all stay up to date with that. I got the Loud Opinions podcast. And I'm, uh, I got some things going on at URL. So just stay tuned for this next chapter right here. And I appreciate Cam Capone News, man. Love. I uh, appreciate you, bro. For sure. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.